Puke Puke Cats on Laptops, there are a number of good reasons to play and enjoy a video game. Exciting gameplay, riveting stories, cool visuals. But often, I find myself enjoying or despising a game based on something a bit more shapeless. A transient, connected set of criteria that define a game's quality beyond how you grade its individual characteristics. But how do you define the ephemeral? How do you capture in verbal human language the way a work of art, specifically an interactive one, makes you feel on a primal level. There is this idea in Szechuan cooking that I've heard on a few travel shows, cooking something for the pleasure of its texture, the way it feels in the mouth, the snap of cartilage, the silky feeling of slime rolling down your tongue. There are a lot of gross things that people like to put in their mouths. So you could say that what I look for most in a work of interactive art is its texture. But what does that mean? I hear you saying. Well, it's just a word that I'm using to collate a wide variety of interconnected artistic traits that there's probably already a word for. In visual mediums, it's aesthetic, a set of principles underlying and guiding the work of a particular artist or artistic movement. You can enjoy a movie, say, for its story or for its aesthetic, or both. But in terms of video games, I could argue that aesthetic makes up only one part of the work's overall texture. So, how do I define texture? Well, it's simple. The general combination of visual aesthetic, sound design, world building, and basic play scenarios. It's as easy as VSUB! So why don't we go through the list and showcase a game that does all four to a spectacular degree. Remedy Entertainment's Control. Oh my gosh, it's so good. That's weird. I'm not expecting anyone. Huh. Wait, wait a second. You have to go check right now? I mean, it'll only take a second. So this is weird. I checked my front door and all that was there was this weird little box covered in dink donks. I guess it's broken. Tell you what, I'm going to put this in the drawing room and we'll get back to the review. You're recording a video. You hear a knock at the door. A Girl Scout selling Thin Mints? No. This afternoon, you've got an express delivery from the Purely Scientific Review Zone. The name doesn't work at all. In this psychedelic romp through the best parts of every office building I've ever seen, you play as Jesse Faden, a hero with a dope name, an even doper jacket, and a ghost best friend. It's an action-packed sci-fi shooter set in the infinitely large headquarters of a shadowy government organization dedicated to the capture and study of objects and entities that slip into our reality from other worlds and or dimensions. <gasps> Whoa, hang on, did you see something on the camera? Did you pick that up, Mr. Octopus? Yeah, everything looks good on this end. Okay. Well, the first criteria is visual aesthetic. Now, this is the most obvious because it has the most in common with the actual definition of the word texture. Our brains are pretty good at picking up on patterns. So when you're a baby and you feel an object, you internalize that this feels coarse and this feels silky smooth. Video games are a purely digital medium, and as such, don't feel like anything. Instead, they manipulate light and visual assets to create the feeling of a surface in your brain. In control, that means concrete. Lots and lots of concrete. There are loads of good videos on Control's use of brutalist architecture, but suffice it to say, it's Control's choice to rigidly stick to the... I'm sorry, you're sure there was nothing on No, the I'm recording? telling you, everything looks completely normal on this end. You pro it probably was like a fly or something. Okay, okay. But suffice it to say, it's Control's choice to rigidly stick to this art movement that allows it to take so many risks and still feel visually consistent throughout. This is one of the most beautiful games I've ever played. And it's all indoors. At least, kind of. 
Sound design is a huge part of any artistic work. Sound can transport us into strange new worlds or into the minds of our characters. In video games, sound has an even bigger role to play. From the death chimes in Dark Souls to the discovery noise in The Legend of Zelda, in games, sound can tell us a lot about what's happening and bring us closer to the world our avatar inhabits. The same is true in Control. Whenever you pick up an object with telekinesis, there's this little whistling sound as the object whirs through the air and to your side. If you wait for the sound to conclude, your throw does more damage. If you decide to throw it while it's still en route, then you might be able to hit an enemy behind cover or follow up on an enemy who's stunned. These kinds of informative sounds are all over from the little gasp Jessie lets out when she can't fly anymore, the sound of enemies warping in behind you, or the telltale chimes of a nearby control point. Control has its own auditory language, so 10 hours in, you know exactly what to expect when wandering the many, many halls of the oldest house. Damn what a cool name. That's not to mention the stellar music or punching gun sounds. Put those together and you have a recipe for a good salsa if salsa was a game. Salsa's not a game. I just didn't have a way to end that section. And now here we are. It sucks. I agree. But maybe if I keep talking I can- Oh my god, there's a goblin on the camera! What are you talking about? Gah. Huh? But what- You probably just have sleep in your eyes. Everything's fine. Let's just finish out the video. I guess... I don't know. World building. Now let's get into that good, good stuff. World building is likely the hardest trait to pin down to one thing and probably consists of its own list of bullet points and charts. Word choice, shot composition, production design, score, background information. But for my purposes, it's any choice that helps to further engross the player and differentiate the story from others. It can be big things, plot details, new locations, rules that restrict the character's actions, or it can be small things, like the scraps of paper or files that you find laying around in control. Some are unnerving and mysterious, while others are complaints about how boring it is to work at the Federal Bureau of Control, or jokes. Whatever they are, they relate to the player that here, in the oldest house, the strange is many things, and has even become mundane, if no less dangerous. Even the name of Control's key location, the oldest house, helps to nudge our minds into imagining things before we even know what's really going on. In a normal suburban house, you're probably at ease. But if the house you're in is called the Death Watcher's Lament, you start thinking, who the heck is the Death Watcher and why is that hallway so dark? Normal things become corrupted in the mind. Big office building, a sea of desks, normal. Big office building with nobody in it called the oldest house? Now we're getting somewhere. Whose house is it? What makes it so old? Who named it? There are a million fine details in control that help to sell its world and drive us beyond the clean aesthetic. Like the Threshold Kids. Lord help me, the Threshold Kids. Some brains can lift objects. This brings us to basic play scenarios. This is by far the most video game specific of the lot. In most media, the story moves at a predetermined pace. In games, the very act of progress can be meaningful. Dark Souls is maybe one of the better examples. The story is one of cycles. People shuffling along, doing the same things over and over again in a vain attempt to keep the light from going out. And so too, is it a game of fighting impossible odds, dying, restarting, doing the same things over and over until you ek forwards an inch only to lose everything and try it all over again. It's hard on purpose. It's slow on purpose. It's a near perfect symbiosis of gameplay and story, each reinforcing the other. Control is not quite as symbiotic, but it does use some of its later mechanics to a similar end. The basic combat of Control is running around, shooting enemies with a gun, and punching them into dust with your punch magic. It doesn't have much to do with going into the unknown or not trusting the rules of the universe at face value, but it is the main thing that Remedy is good at. What is thematically resonant is the genre. Control is a Metroidvania or a game with a big map of connected corridors and rooms that you gain access to slowly through acquisition of keys or, more commonly, powers. 
Control uses the slow acquisition of powers and knowledge and security clearance cards to highlight Jesse's journey of discovery. In the beginning, you're running around shooting fools like a child. But by the end, you're a floating wizard that can tear apart walls with your mind. Not to mention that familiarizing yourself with before unknown and terrifying regions until they become friendly and almost banal is part of what being in the Federal Bureau of Control is. You're constantly surrounded by inexplicable events and objects and things that warp the very nature of existence, but you can only really see so many telekinetic toasters before you're like, oh gosh, another one. So why is all this stuff so important? Without it, any game could be any other game. Let's compare Control to, say, Jedi Fallen Order. Both are games with interconnected worlds that open up as you unlock knowledge and powers. Both are games where a slender redhead fights evil forces with mind powers that let them throw objects with their minds. But the two games feel completely and totally different from one another. Partly because they're differing focus on ranged or melee combat, but also because Control is eerie, full of strange, creepy ideas and people that exist within a facsimile of our own world, yet somehow beyond it. And Fallen Order is a Star Wars. To further drill down on that point and get real scientific with it for a second, I think that- OH MY GOD THAT TIME I DEFINITELY SAW SOMETHING! I LOOK AT IT! I don't know, MMP. It doesn't look like anything to me. A goblin! I knew it! I f***ing knew there was a goblin on the camera. Will you calm down? It's fine. There's no such thing as goblins. It's probably just a fleck of dust or something. Have you not eyes? I don't know. Do I? Mr. Octopus, what the f***? It doesn't look like anything to me. Mr. Octopus, what did he do to you? Wait, where is You'll the- You'll never be late on Tuesdays. Yeah! Well, looks like I'll die in this supply closet, just like Mom always told me. Well, at least I have podcasts. I'd never have time to listen to my podcasts. Hey, a pair of glasses. That's weird. Who left these in here? Hmm, and they fit. Why, isn't that the darndest thing you've ever seen? Well, it's been some time. I hope I don't. <laughs> that have been? Oh. Oh my. They've gone and done it. They've blown up the world. Goblins and all. Oh no. I'm all alone now. All alone in the world. Anyway. Thank goodness I have my podcasts. Why, I have enough podcasts on this for months. For March and, and April and June and, and so on and so forth. Silver linings, I suppose. Let me just get out my earphones. Oh, no, no! No, 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 this can't be. But it's not fair. There was time now. There was finally time to listen to my podcasts. When your mind is shattered, everything falls away. The people you know, the places you feel safe, for the first time, you look down and realize you're in a snow globe. What? Oh, no, you're not supposed to talk to me. I'm a framing device. How the hell do you get this to snow globe? Also, how the hell do you get to this in general? Time enough at last? That's, there's... There's like a bazillion episodes of The Twilight Zone full of imaginative creatures and and you pick time enough at last? Hence the snow globe. Jazz it up a little. There's... This is nothing to do with the snow Neither globe. did running a hospital, but that didn't stop saying elsewhere. I don't know what that means. I'm young. What's even happening? You've become aware of a different place. Where fantasy meets reality. Where truth becomes fiction and your mind is... It's the weird little box, isn't it? No. I mean... I don't even know what you're talking about. The box? The weird one that showed up at my doorstep with the flip I switched? 
doesn't ring any bells. I flip that switch on it and <gasps> I flip that switch. So I must be able to switch it back. Assuming I knew what box you were talking about, how can you even reach it? I mean, by walking clearly, but... <gasps> Gah! What have you done, you ghoul? Nothing that doesn't perfectly make narrative sense. Ha ha ha. You think this will stop me? Ha <laughs> ha. Hey, stop that right now. It's not in the moral lesson of the episode. Huh. No. Oh, good. Oh, thank goodness. I have hands again. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Hey, sorry it was late. I got stuck in traffic because uh, I don't have a car. How are you doing today? Ready to record an episode? You know, when I was younger, I just assumed that the sad guy who breaks his glasses deserved it somehow. When I heard about it, I just assumed that it was a uh, karmic punishment. But, um, I saw the episode and uh, it feels like someone just dared Rod Sterling to adapt the saddest story he could find. It's just so fucking mean and sad. And like, why? He just wanted his books. Sounds like a good time for lunch.